Greetings, fellow scribes and scriveners. This is Fictitious, a podcast about writing and genre storytelling, presented by Nerd for a Living. I'm Adrian Buskey. Let's call this episode a prequel, as it's a rebroadcast that originally appeared on our flagship show, Nerd for a Living. But I think it's an excellent example of the kinds of conversations we'll be bringing you. This interview is with Hugo Award-winning author Mary Robinette Kowal. We spoke during the release of her novel Ghost Talkers, a historical fantasy set in Europe during World War I. And while period paranormal sort of romance isn't one of my usual go-to genres for reading, Ghost Talkers was still one of my favorite novels of 2016. It's simply a terrific book with graceful prose, an intriguing premise, and well-realized characters. It follows Ginger, an American medium working with the British Army as part of their spirit corps. British soldiers heading into combat are specially trained so that, should they die, their departing souls report first to the mediums of the spirit corps. And this allows them to share instant information about enemy threats with military intelligence. Ginger is engaged to a British intelligence officer, but while he is away at the front, she discovers the presence of a traitor. Without her fiancé to validate her findings to the top brass, her reports are dismissed, and things get worse as it becomes clear that the Spirit Corps are being directly targeted by the German war effort. Ghost Talkers, published by Tor Books, is available now, and I highly recommend it. Mary and I talk about how that novel came together, and we also explore other facets of her career, including her award-winning work as a puppeteer, and her side gig as a voiceover artist, reading audiobooks and short stories for other authors. First off, you've got a brand new book, Ghost Talkers, from Tor. I will say that I am just about five chapters into it so far. So not that we would get into spoilers anyway, but I'll plug my ears and go, no, 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 if I hear anything too wild and crazy. (laughs) But, you know, I got to say, even from the first chapter, that it's a very gripping premise and idea. I mean, I sat down at lunch yesterday and I got through that first chapter and I was like, oh man, that's like such a great lead off this concept. World War One with the Spirit Corps and you've done a lot of like historical fiction. Does it count as speculative fiction or like, I don't yeah. know how the genres always work with that. I always think of the genres as like a, a big umbrella terms and you just get more and more specific. So, you know, we've got fiction and then literature and then within literature, we have speculative fiction, contemporary literature And then within speculative fiction, we have science fiction and fantasy and horror. And then within science fiction, we have steampunk and space opera, or the some people will say steampunk goes in fantasy, depending on the book. So yeah, so this is in fantasy, I would call this historical fantasy. How much digging and research did you have to dive into to figure out how to place this particular bit of fiction? A fair bit, largely because most of what I knew about women's roles in World War I was informed by media and was flat wrong. So in media, they tend to be confined to being nurses or women at home wringing their hands. And in fact, women were heavily involved in every country that was involved in World War One, and pretty much every aspect. I mean, there were women fighter pilots, granted in Russia, not in Britain, but there's pretty much not an occupation that you can find that women were not heavily involved in, in including, well, maybe not heavily involved in, because the top brass was pretty much all men all the time. You said we always have this media skewed version of things. We've seen a handful of movies and they give us this idea of what things are like from that time period. But, you know, during the World Wars, those were an all hands on deck Mm -hmm. kind of time period. I mean, these days, I feel like even though we are constantly aware of the wars that are going on in the world because of the media cycle, in reality, those things don't touch our lives very directly unless we have a family member that's in it or we are actively involved in the armed services or if we are unfortunate enough to live in a country that's war-torn and deals with those things on a daily basis. But as Americans, I think we're very isolated and insulated from it. But in World War One and World War Two, life was always impacted by them. There was so much effort in those wars in order to keep everything running. So this idea of, you know, one half of the population not being involved and sitting it out is nonsense. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that America in World War II, women were obviously much more involved. But for America, our relationship with World War I is is pretty distanced. We came in right at the end 
And because of that, because there was no conflict happening on the home front, because the amount of rationing and, as you said, the impact of the war on the home front was fairly limited. Yes, lots of guys got sent over, but most of them came home. And that was not true when you're looking at other countries. So our our view of it is very romanticized and is very distant. And, and in fact, a lot of the women who were involved from American women in World War One were people who felt like it was their duty and they went to Canada or Britain or Australia or Scotland or sometimes just went straight. You know, it's like, hello, hello, Belgium, would you like a nurse? and went and volunteered directly because the U.S. wasn't sending any women. It's funny. My father was quite a bit older, and he actually fought in World War II. Mm -hmm. And growing up and watching a lot of those films with him, like there was this sort of like adventure factor to all the movies that surrounded World War I and World War II. And I don't think it was until, you know, we got into like the Vietnam War where suddenly our fiction really hit the difficulty and the awfulness living with a, you know, a veteran of two tours of World War II. He didn't talk about the scary stuff. He talked about the times out, the drinking, the meeting the Andrew yeah. sisters and walking down the streets of Italy at the end of the war and celebrating like they didn't cover the horror of it. It seemed like as a generation, they kind of almost wanted to stamp that stuff down. I know we're way off field uh, with that, but um, <laughs> but then getting into this book then, like, where did you delve into things in order to frame this and, and to think about it from a woman's point of view and to figure out where their place was? What was the research? What were you going into? Well, I researched a lot of different books. K-80s uh, Fighting on the Home Front was enormously influential, which talks about the role of women all through the war. Uh, there's also, and I'm going to forget the name of the editor, but it's a, a book called Diaries of a Nurse at the Front. It is her diary. This is her diary, and they've just transcribed it. And sometimes in between months or if there's a big break, they'll give you some grounding detail. But she was doing exactly the thing that you were talking about your father doing. She was talking about how we just got in this giant train of wounded, and most of them are coughing up their lungs because of mustard gas. And then we went for a walk in the garden. And the flowers and the peonies are in bloom, and it's really lovely. And you're like, this is the same diary entry. And it was clear that at a certain point, things normalized. You had to find the beauty in things, or you would just go mad. And, and a lot of people did. But it was, it was really amazing. So I was, I was looking at her diaries, Voices of a Lost Generation, or Forgotten Voices of the Psalm, excuse me which was a collection of first-person interviews of people who lived, who survived. And every single one of them, it's like, I don't know why I'm still alive. Interview after interview of these guys going over the top and everyone around them getting mowed down. And then I also looked a lot at the ambulance drivers, which were predominantly women. They were on the front line. They were going in and picking up wounded men and hauling them back to field stations and dealing with incredible trauma. And most of them had PTSD, but of course it wasn't. First of all, it was something that they were only just recognizing as a genuine problem. And second, you know, they were women and they weren't seeing combat. So of course they weren't having problems. They were just being emotional. It's a nice way to write off the severe trauma of being surrounded by horror every day. Yeah, and watching man after man after man under your care die. Or know that some of them died in transit. Some of them you had no idea if they were going to live, and you never got closure on that. They would take them back and drop them off and have no idea if they lived or died. That would carry a lot of mental baggage to always yeah. kind of be thinking about, well, I did this, but I don't know if it made any difference. I don't know whatever happened to them. I think there's like a survivor's guilt that happens from mm -hmm. it because you never know what happens. My father got blown off the side of a hill, wandered Jeez. around uh, for a week behind enemy lines, shell-shocked and deaf, and didn't know where he was at until he ran into a supply train that picked him up and then spent six weeks recovering in a hospital unit. And then went back. And then went back. And then went right back in. And that's the insanity of it is that you go through something like that and they kind of dust you off and they're like, oh, you can hear again? That's great. Here's a gun. Go back mm -hmm. into it. We always have to talk of like greatest generations and these tougher generations, but we think about ourselves, we get freaked out when we lose track of our phone, you All know, right. or like maybe somebody passive regressively takes a shot at us on Facebook or something. You feel slighted by somebody. And then we have these earlier generations that were literally fighting to survive. And like we said, like had to go through tremendous horror and then turn around and go right back into the breach again. It's crazy. One of the things, again, that I get one of the soldiers 
said this, and I, I wish I could remember who, but he said that he felt like people had certain thresholds of upset, that you would get upset at something that was X amount out of your normal. And that what happened in wartime was that your normal shifted. So it wasn't that you could take more. It's just that X amount out of your normal was in a different place. Because he said that he would get upset about stupid things when he came back. And they were the same stupid things he got upset about before he went. But he would find himself doing a lot more second guessing of his reactions when he came back. But I thought that was very interesting, the idea that we have a, a threshold within which we are comfortable and you can move kind of the entire thing. And I think that really goes a lot to explain how people can continue to live in places that are war torn and, you know, still go to school and things. It's like, oh, OK, it's bombing again. Well, that's normal. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's but, bombing next door. That's not normal. That's traumatic. All the stories of people who grew up as children in places that were getting constantly bombed and yet still managed to play or to goof around or try to build some sort of semblance life. When your status quo is things exploding, you adjust to it and keep going, I guess, as well as you can. Yeah. And then still get upset because he would say that his buddies would get blown up and then he would be upset because his ration of beans was shorted. <laughs> I guess it's your immediate concerns, you know, I, yeah. I, I think at a certain point you have to block out that stuff as well. And I thought that was interesting in, in just in, you know, the first couple of chapters of ghost talkers, you know, you've got ginger who, you know, is sort of our point of view character and she's a medium and she's talking to soldiers that have passed away and they're immediately reporting back to tell the last details of their life, which is a fascinating concept. And, hearing from them where they're like the, the soldiers themselves are pushing away the horror of their own death that just just happened and they're focused on the mundane elements i think the first one that we see in the book Quigley. yeah comes in and, and he's immediately like oh but i remember to put my watch up so that i knew what to catch which time and he was sort of focused on this like hey i did a good job i did what i was supposed to do and he's dead <laughs> and and it's such this kind of small kind of thing but i was like but yeah that's how people would be you would kind of adjust to your circumstance and be like but i need to feel good about myself in this moment that i did what i needed to do and take away the best part of it was the idea of the spirit core the idea of these mediums working to communicate with them did that come out of any specific idea of spiritualism from that time period was there any seed in real life for that there were a lot of attempts actually to harness remote viewing to use for spying. Mostly, actually, Russia was working on that. But the British spiritualism movement really, even though it had started much earlier, really kicked off and got ground because of World War I and because people were wanting to somehow communicate and say goodbye to their loved ones. And it was about having a sense of closure, which is, is one of the things that the Spirit Corps in my book said that, you know, this is one of the things that they actually try to do for the soldiers is to give them a sense of you've done well, to give them a sense of purpose for their death, because so many of the deaths were completely meaningless, just numbers. So looking at those fundamentals of, of spiritualism, and I, and I have to say that my version of spiritualism is highly fictionalized. I have a book called, I think it's How to Improve Your Psychic Powers from 1928, which is fantastic by Hereward Carrington. And it, I got a lot of the details out of that, how auras would appear, what colors, stuff like that. But other stuff, I just made up whole cloth. I was originally going to have eight people in a circle because that was a good balanced number and I saw lots of references to it. And that was too many characters. <laughs> I was like... That's two characters that I don't need. And I couldn't, in order to have the sense of a circle and anchoring, I still needed some. So I wound up with six mundanes and two mediums. The uh, other things that were grounded in reality regarding that. Oh, actually, I guess this is kind of related. This is the only thing I have written, one of two things, actually, that came out of a dream which seems highly apropos for something involving mediums. <laughs> it had nothing to do with World War I. It was just kind of like this. The only thing I can remember about it is lots of black velvet and really fabulous clothes and Ginger, who didn't have a name at the time, but Ginger being a medium who solved murder mysteries in a kind of thin man sort of setting. And so I actually wrote two short stories, and the novel was the backstory for Ginger. And I was like, that is way more interesting than the short stories. So I, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> 
spiritualism is still an active religion. The thing I do not want anyone to do coming into this book is to think that I have used the word and I have used a lot of the trappings that go with it, but no one should make fun of people who are practicing spiritualists because there's a lot of unexplained stuff out in the world and <laughs> it is, as far as I can tell, significantly more reasonable than seeing the face of Jesus in toast. <laughs> I don't know, man. Maybe Jesus, like, that's his medium, you know? <laughs> You know, everybody got their thing. He's just like, man, toast is awesome. I'm just going to show up over there. Hey, dude, I'm in your toast today. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty friendly way to start the day, right? <laughs> you know, like it pops up. And you're like, all right, it's time to butter some toast and get my day going. Hey, there's Jesus. That's probably horribly offensive to a few people. But I always think it's a pretty a pretty happy way to, to get things going. I mean, if it, you know, if it's the Virgin Mary and she starts crying, then that's a whole other thing. I feel like that would be a traumatic way to start the day. Yes, absolutely. 100%. Did you know, random trivia, just to change the subject slightly, that the word marionette is because people used to do religious figures in churches that would move on their own that were string puppets? I did not know that. That is amazing. And that is also the best segue into the next part of the conversation. You did that very I well. I would appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, normally I'm the segue guy, but you, you nailed that. So that brings us very nicely into – beyond, you know, you've written a whole bunch of books and you've won Hugo and won Campbell's and all that stuff. But you're also a puppeteer. Yeah. <laughs> How does that happen? How do those two things go together? I actually think they go together really well. They're both a form of storytelling. And really the, the job of the puppeteer and the writer is to connect with an audience – in both cases, we are taking things that are not alive, inanimate objects and words, and we are trying to replicate the condition of life that an audience will recognize and respond to. So for me, they are 100% related, to say nothing of the narrative aspects of puppetry. But I was basically I was one of those kids who wanted to do everything, and puppetry neatly combines everything that I wanted to do. I started my first novel when I was in high school, wrote it through college, took like 10 years to finish. No one will ever see it. It involves my D&D &D character. <laughs> As many of our first novels do. As many do, yes. Somehow my D&D &D character was also involved, like a winged space alien cat thing that could also look like a person. And then there was something about Battlestar Galactica and A-Team. It was, it's a mess. But I did that and then got into puppetry and was getting my creative jollies through puppetry and kind of let the writing go to the side for about 10 years. But yeah, no, I have a, I'm still active in it. Not as much these days, but, but still working. And uh, so I've got 20 plus years doing it now. And you worked with like the Jim Henson Company. And, yeah. You know, so there's some big award that goes along with that. Yes, I will save you from having to figure out how to say it. Um, <laughs> it's the Unima USA Citation of Excellence, which was founded by Jim Henson. It's the highest award an American puppeteer can achieve. And Unima stands for... Union Internationale de la Marionette, which is the international puppetry organization. It is the oldest continually operating arts organization in the world. When you get that yeah. certification, what do they give you? Is it a fancy statue? You it's get a pin? It's a beautiful, beautiful certificate. And normally you don't go, ah, oh, that certificate is lovely. This is beautifully illustrated and gilt, and it is really one of the most lovely pieces of paper that I have ever been able to touch and handle. Normally there are these computer printed certificates, and this is really not. This is a, a work of art. And it's hand lettered. It's gorgeous. I just thought maybe they would make a puppet of you and then be like, here you go. Here's our award. It's you as a puppet. Yeah, that would not be an award for any puppeteer. <laughs> That's like, hey, you're a plumber. Have a wrench. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> okay, that does make sense. I can see how that would not be so much of a thing. Like, Here's that thing that you're already like developing carpal tunnel for. And maybe having a little mini me of you hanging in the corner would be kind of creepy, too. You know, there is that. Maybe just like, a And bit. then, like, what am I going to do with it? Uh, plus, there were multiple people involved in each of the shows. And the award goes to the show. So it is, it is to the work and then the people who create the work are listed. One of them was for Between Two Worlds, which was at Tears of Joy Theater, and I was the scenic designer on that one. And the other was, was actually a show that my, my own company did, Old Man Who Made Trees Blossom, and I wrote it, and I did the puppets, and I was one of the performers. But there were two other performers in that, Jody Eichelberger and Lance Wollin, and they are why we got that. Did you do voice work in those as well? 
Not in between two worlds. I, I actually know. I take that back. I did do voice work. I was the original Leia in that. Old Man Who Made Trees Blossom. I was a dog, so I did a lot of barking <laughs> and panting. Here, for your listening audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Thank you. <laughs> I can actually generate a one-page resume of nothing but dog rolls. <laughs> but... That's not the only voice work you do either. So beyond being the voice of a dog in live production, you also <laughs> right. you also do audiobook reads. Yeah. Because you didn't have enough careers already, Mary. You had to tack on a whole other thing. Well, you know, so here's the thing. And this is, I think, an important thing for anyone who is considering being a writer. You have to diversify your income. It is a freelance job. So basically, my career is that I'm a freelancer and I happen to have multiple skill sets or have figured out how to take one skill set and make it look like multiples. Because writing, that's a version of playwriting for theater. It's just a different medium. Voice work, that's like puppetry, but without the pain. <laughs> I get to sit in a little box on a fairly comfortable chair and read a book out loud. And I don't have to hold a puppet over my head. I don't have to be in any bizarre positions. Most puppetry positions look like yoga that is actually designed to hurt you rather than helping you. I would imagine there's probably a lot of chiropractic needs for people in the, the puppet community. I haven't done chiropractor, but I tell you, my occupational therapist and physical therapists and massage therapists are beautiful people. Um, <laughs> they should be on everybody's team. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. It'll change your life if you have never done it before. And I'm a big believer in chiropractory, too, because they put me back together pretty regularly. Because mm. as a person who works on computers most of the time, you develop a lot of horrible postures and bad habits. And like a car that goes out of alignment, sometimes you have to have everything kind of put back into place so that you can run smoothly again. I have had more back problems being a writer than I ever had as a puppeteer. And this includes doing puppets that weighed 125 pounds. Well, at least with puppeteering, it, posturing is probably bad, but at least you're moving around. Whereas I think that you yeah. know, people don't think about the long-term toll of just sitting in front of a laptop and then slowly conforming your body around the edge of a desk or a <laughs> cafe table. And even no matter like how great your eyesight is, sooner or later you start kind of leaning in to see what's going on. And uh, yeah, it takes its toll on you. Yeah, I actually have a timer now. So I get up every 30 minutes or so and just stretch for a few minutes. It's a, about a minute of stretch routine, and then I sit back down and work again, and it makes a huge difference in my, my ability to function. Is it the same thing when you do the, the voice work, when you go into a studio and you just have like a period of time where you have to give your voice a break, get up and move, go back to the mic? I record about two hours at a time, so I'll record for about two hours and then take a 15-minute break, record for another two, take lunch for about an hour. And then same thing in the afternoon, two hours on, 15 break, two more hours. So eight hour days usually. Do you have like an agency that you work with out of Chicago to do those? No, I usually, I do most of my work for uh, Brilliance and Audible. And then occasionally I pick up gigs with other publishers. Usually an author has requested me, which is nice. It's a nice thing to, to have. But just those two. And I got them the way you get pretty much any theater gig, which is I auditioned. I actually had to audition to narrate my own book as well, <laughs> even though I had a track record at that point. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it's good to for publishers to check and make sure it's good. But yeah, at the same time, it's yours. So you think it'd be kind of a no-brainer. But there, I know a lot of authors who don't like to read their own oh, work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There are authors who should never be allowed to read their own work aloud. And I say this with a great deal of love and compassion. Most authors should never be allowed to read their own book aloud because it's very easy to kill text. All you have to do really is think about reading the words instead of telling the story, and it's pretty much dead. Well, you also bring like a number of accents to the table, too. You've got a, a fair amount of dialect ability. I try. Um, depending on the reviewer, I'm either really good at it or really, really terrible at it. <laughs> My favorite of the negative reviews was on a book that was set in the South. And so, you know, I was, I was doing this for most of the characters in there, just... Slipping into this southern accent, not a particularly heavy one, but, but I am from North Carolina, and my family is from East Tennessee. So this is uh, your basic East Tennessee accent. There, there's some thicker versions of it, like um, I have a cousin who said to me once, Y'all ever had a burrito? Which I use now when I need to do somebody who's really country. Because it is, oh my goodness, you can cut that thing with a knife. But, uh, but the review was, 
her Southern accent was terrible. They should have gotten a native Southerner to do this. <laughs> and I'm like, um, my family came over in the 1600s to the South. And I've got markers of the Southern accent still all through my voice. It's just, if you don't know linguistics, you probably won't spot them. A lot of times people have, the, one, they only recognize a singular version of a dialect yep. or the only the broad and one. Most of the time it's the Southern California dialect, not the Southeastern. I worked in radio for 11 years and occasionally would sub in and do voices for commercials. Oh, and fun. occasionally, for whatever reason, they would need like Irish accents or British accents. And when doing radio, they absolutely insisted that every Irish accent was this comical leprechaun thing. Oh, it's the luck of the Irish. Exactly. Let's hear yours. Let's hear it. Oh, goodness. I don't know if I have quite the lilt available to me. Um, because I usually start off with a bit of a British accent in order to find my paces. And then I put a little bit of lilt into it in order that I can find my way into it, you know? Something kind of subtle, not too bad at all, but um, just to find the, the way to having that musicality to the speech, the little ups and downs of how it works. Oh, that's very nice, actually. That's significantly better than mine. Oh. <laughs> well, they would always reject it whenever I would do it because it was too subtle. And I based it off of speakers that I had met and people that I'd watched on TV. And they weren't necessarily from, like, deep Ireland where, like, yeah. it gets so thick. But, yeah, they always wanted the leprechaun version. And so, yeah. it was pretty goofy. But, yeah, so it makes sense to me that there would be people who would review and be like, oh, that's just not how that sounds. Yeah. But things like that do make me significantly calmer about reviews in general. Because, you know, just reviews for fiction or audiobooks or whatever it is, they make it really, really apparent that this is one person's opinion, and they might be high. They very well might be. And yet the subjectivity of any of that stuff, it's the challenge even when you talk about things that you enjoy, like when you're reviewing anything, even putting something out into this Twitter sphere, I have a tendency to say before I speak my opinion on anything, maybe works for some people, just doesn't work for me. Your mileage may vary, but this is how I feel about something. When I go out to speak, I'm never trying to discredit anybody else's feeling about it. And sometimes you also have to tiptoe because people get very sensitive about the things that they absolutely love and they want to protect it. And they think that somebody not enjoying it is an attack on it because sometimes the phrasing is like that. But it's not always yeah. the case. Yeah, well, and a lot of times I think people will make the jump, um, I didn't like it, therefore it is bad, which is a logical fallacy. Being structurally flawed, being bad, doesn't necessarily mean unenjoyable. And likewise, something can be completely, perfectly constructed and not for you, as you say. Edvard Munch's The Scream, using, using art, that is a fantastic painting. It's an amazing piece of art. I would not want that hanging in my home. Yeah, me neither. I don't I, like it either. <laughs> I do not enjoy looking at that, even though I recognize that it is really, really good. But it's also, you know, its job is to make me uncomfortable, and it does that in spades. And I feel like it's that way with any form of expression. I have friends who work in commercial arts and other ones that work in, you know, quote unquote, fine arts, which are still commercial in a lot of ways, but separated by genre to a degree. And the ones in fine arts sometimes rail against that idea of like, oh, people, they want to hang all this mass produced crap on their walls, but they don't appreciate like real art. And while... I can understand why they'd be frustrated that these things that take six weeks to create is harder to get into somebody's into something that they enjoy rather than something somebody knocked out on a Cintiq tablet in a couple of hours. At the same time, it's it's about the emotions those communicate. And mm -hmm. like you said, when you've got a piece that makes you fundamentally feel uncomfortable or doesn't hit your taste, you're going to reject it out of hand. You might It might make you think. You might want to stare at it for a little bit and consider it. But it doesn't mean that you want to wake up to it every day and walk out to it in your living room and be like, ah, there's that thing that causes me to have existential crisis. <laughs> right. Yeah. My husband is a winemaker and people are always asking him, is this a good wine? And he's, his response every single time is, do you like it? Then it's a good wine. Right. Yeah. Uh, it may be flawed, but then it's enjoyable. Conversely, he also has a t-shirt that says, friends don't let friends drink white Zinfandel. White Zinfandel is terrible, but I am also not a wine drinker of any kind. I fall into the case of I have no palate for wine and no palate for coffee. So I immediately alienate myself from tons of people because they're like, how? I'm like, I drink a lot of tea, just lots and lots of tea. I love coffee and I have a caffeine intolerance, so I cannot actually drink it. Um, I have to be careful even with decaf and chocolate, which I find really objectionable. That is a terrible situation to be in. And my wife is in a very similar one. The same thing. The caffeine intolerance. And she also can't drink beer, which she loves. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a bad combo. It's a crying shame. <laughs>
What's not a crying shame, to circle back around, is that Ghost Talkers is being released on... That's the almost awkward segue in the world, but here we go. It uh, gets released on August 16th from Tor, and so it's going to be available on all of the usual channels, I'm sure. Amazon and Barnes & Noble, I've got the physical copy that I've been reading in hand. The, uh, it's got a gorgeous cover, and uh, like I said, several chapters in, and I'm totally enthralled with it. I'm really interested in, in the characters, and specifically really like that aspect of having this look into World War One from a woman's perspective, but this exploration of the mysticism and stuff. What else are you doing in prep for this? Are you touring, speaking, reading, any of that kind of stuff? Uh, let's see, doing a book launch party in Chicago, uh, Worldcon. I'm going to be doing a roving book launch party. I'm doing a number of different events, but most of them are actually in November to take advantage of me being on the West Coast already. I'm going to be at Wordstock in Portland. And then they have told me the names of other places that I'm going, and my brain is not going to give them to me at the moment when I'm <laughs> supposed to be marketing myself. But there is a list on my website. Ha ha. There is a list on my website of where I will be and when. So where should people be following you? What, what are the URLs and the Twitters and all those good places? The URL for my website is my entire very long name, Mary Robinette Kowal. Uh, allow me to take a moment just as a public service announcement to let everyone know that Robinette is my middle name. So when you're <laughs> trying to find me in the alphabet, Kowal. Kowal is the last name. There is no hyphen uh, there. There's no hyphen. And then everywhere else, Twitter, Instagram, you can find me at Mary Robinette. Very good. Well, we will uh, look forward to seeing that big release and wish you the, the best of success with Ghost Talkers and everything that comes out next. Thanks thank for, you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Fictitious. Ghost Talkers is available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble in hardcover or as an ebook, and you can find out more at her website, maryrobinettekowal.com. The home for Fictitious and all of the Nerd for a Living family of podcasts is nerdforaliving.com. Check out our full archive of episodes, sign up for our mailing list, and then follow us on Twitter where we tweet as at Nerd for a Living. And I'm on there too as at Adrian Buskey, so give me a holler. Fictitious is available on iTunes and many other apps and services. Subscribe for more interviews with awesome writers. And when you need to procrastinate for a minute, write us a review. I know you can make one that's fun to read. This podcast is produced by Wendy Buskey and me, Adrian Buskey. Fictitious and the Nerd for a Living family of podcasts are a production of Armadian Media and Entertainment. Now then, author friends, get back to writing.